Well, I always start with a client. I always want to know their coping skills first. And whenever we're going to do this delicate work, I want to make sure that they have a toolbox. Welcome to the Phase 4 Podcast, inspired by Vishen Lakhiani and Ajit Nawalka, co-founders of Evercoach, a division of Vine Valley. In this podcast, we speak to coaches and creatives about where they were, where they are, and where they are going. This is the intersection of what we focus on expands, and your story is your superpower. My guest today is Laura Martinez. Oops, I'm gonna do that again. Yeah. My guest my guest today is Laura Martinez. She's a therapist, spiritual healer, author, speaker a meditation guide, and a lot more. And we're about to dig into it and find out all of this beautiful stuff. So, Laura, thank you for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. And I love that you got my name right. I love it because not a lot of people say it correctly. So thank you for that. Thank you. Um, I was like digging into your background, your story, and it's just magical. So maybe can you start us off by just telling us a little more about yourself and how you kind of ended up where you are today. Yeah, yeah. So I started off uh, with neuroscience research at Texas A&M uh, in College Station. And that led me to working at an addiction treatment center. And I became the director there for a psychoneuroplasticity center uh, within the addiction center. And that was a lot of fun. I did that for eight years and absolutely loved it. And while I was doing all of that, I was going back and forth uh, from here to Costa Rica and learning about shamanism. <laughs> and I started incorporating shamanism into the treatment that we were giving our patients. And the results of that were epic. And the clients absolutely loved it and found that healing was a lot faster than they had ever experienced before. So after I left that treatment facility, I started my own private practice and I have been weaving neuroscience, shamanism, mental health therapy, uh, and now I'm Reiki certified. So I'm weaving that in as well. It's been just a ton of fun being in private practice and doing that. Beautiful. We love Reiki on the Phase Four podcast. Um, so your your story is really special and unique, and I think the time in history, maybe in America, is the perfect time for someone like you, just because of the breakthroughs that are happening, because the laws are starting to change, open up, and because mental health is a huge problem, bigger than it ever was. Oh yeah. And so. You skipped over one or two parts that I love is like you have a, um, and it's very humble, but you have a couple of books and they're written in with a co-author and are they like academic based and very scientific? Would you yeah. like to talk about those for a bit? Yeah, I always forget about those. I think that, <laughs> I'll be completely honest, those books took so much time and effort I remember I was working uh, at the treatment facility and I would come straight home and work on the book. And it was the the uh, psychoneural plasticity in addiction. That book took about two years of my life every day. So I think there's a book <laughs> that blocks it out to be completely honest. But you're right, it is academic. It's um, actually more of a textbook. And um, there was a class in the University of Miami that was actually using it in as a part of their neuroscience curriculum so i thought that was super cool yeah but the book is basically it talks about neuro neuroscience and it talks about addiction and how we can weave that into addiction treatment right and did i see something about like specifically geared more towards cocaine addiction so yeah, so yeah, that was very, uh, very intuitive of you, actually, because I don't know if it's mentioned in there, but uh, my background, my neuroscience background is in cocaine addiction. Um, when I worked at Texas A&M, we were specifically working on pollution and lead and whether that affected 
you to be more addicted to cocaine. So basically inner cities. Wow. What did you find out? That it did. Uh, it was, Whoa. Yeah. 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 That was a five-year study. And basically, um, if you have lead in the brain or if you have pollution, if you're around a polluted area, it actually can turn on those genes that are predisposed to have addiction. Wow. That's like shocking kind of. It's wow. huge. Yeah. I, I think the research is still being developed around that concept, but um, these genes can turn on if we have lead in the brain. It's pretty fascinating. And I know we're talking epigenetics there, right? Yeah, exactly. Beautiful. So let's shift back to, uh, I think you said Costa Rica, right? So you, you go down there, you learn about shamanism, but you have a, a family connection to this field, correct? Yeah, yeah. You just gave me goosebumps when you said that because, um, I, you know, I always love looking back at that time in my life. Um, the very first time I went to Costa Rica, I was 19 years old. And I was just a chick wanting to surf, have some beers, maybe uh, flirt around, or just have some fun. And I went and um, on a surf trip, and I found this uh, guy who was a waiter, actually. And we were just kind of bantering back and forth. And on a palm tree, there was um, an advertisement for a shaman couple to go do work with them. And I was just joking around. I said, I told him, I said, should I go see this shaman? And he got serious and said, you absolutely should in Spanish. And he said, I will take you there if you want me to. And usually I wouldn't go off with a stranger. I wouldn't do this. I mean, I was pretty smart, even though I was 19 and my frontal cortex is not fully developed, right? But I went and uh, he took me there and I did powerful work. And the first experience I had was with a peacock, a spirit animal. And I just knew there was something really huge about this. So I just kept going back for more and learning more. Um, and then pretty fascinating. I was having fast forward, right? Uh, about 10 years past that. Uh, and I was having a conversation with my grandma and she was asking me, you know, what do you do for a living exactly? Kind of, and I was telling her about my job. And if I want to stay on the surface with people, sometimes I'll just say I'm a mental health therapist and kind of leave it at that. But I don't go get into the shamanic aspect. But, you know, she's my grandma and she I can tell she's really genuinely interested. So I start telling her I'm doing ceremonies and rituals and I'm taking people into these healing states. And she looked at me and she said, my mom used to do that. Your great grandma did that. And I said, what? She said, yeah, your grandma, Guadalupe, she would do that. And she said, I remember when I was a little girl, people would knock on our door in the middle of the night and my mother would do healing rituals and take us outside of the home to do them because it, if she got caught, she could be persecuted for doing this type of work. Um, and she said, I can't believe, I mean, she just started crying. She's like, I can't believe you're doing this work. So it get, I get really emotional about it because the fact that I can be out loud, write books, you know, advertise that I, you know, do shamanic practitioner work is a blessing that my great grandma did not get that privilege. So, right. Yeah. And I think it's, it's important that there is that science background and, uh, um, just the education aspect instead of just people might view it if it was just one way as something else, right? Where now it's like we're bridging the science and the spirituality and it's all one thing and we know this. It is. It's such an exciting time right now. Do you know who Jose Silva is? Yeah, the Silva method in mind control. I love Jose Silva. Yeah, it's some pretty cool stuff with that. So that's a good recommendation for anyone. Jose Silva method. Um, and I think bringing, bringing it into mental health, especially. And so I have a bit of a background, my own personal story, and I facilitate mental health groups as well. So bringing it into that, it's like people are, I don't want to say hopeless, but they have no hope. And I think it's two different things. And just looking on the news, right? Just looking around everything. There's just so much pressures coming to people and people just trying to survive. 
And so what you're bringing offers more to it. I think, especially over the last four or five years, we've seen that people are isolated, people are trapped, and people aren't doing well. And so you're bringing the the therapist side of it, but you're also bringing the shamanic practice. And when I'm saying that people are hopeless, not hopeless, that there's no hope, it's like they've tried so many things and they're doing all the things and they're doing what they're supposed to and still they're not feeling better or purposeful. But now this new method helps us to do that a little more. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I really believe that. I mean, something that my clients will tell me is I have never gone so deep into my healing process. And a lot of the reasons I think that's because when we're including the shamanic practice, we're taking them deep into a subconscious state and you're going into an altered reality, altered state of reality. And when we do that, we can really heal our wounds because I really do believe our wounds are located in that subconscious state. And when we're just doing talk therapy, and I think talk therapy is great and has its, you know, you need to process but when we're solely doing talk therapy, we're really only hitting the conscious mind instead of like, you know, before we got onto the podcast, we were actually doing breath work together and I felt myself getting deeper into my soul, right? While we did that practice. And um, I think that there's a lot of value into us healing our body and healing our mind and our spirit. And if we're just talking, we can only hit the mind probably on that conscious level. Yeah. And so this allows you to just kind of skip over the trying to logically think about it and step by step fix it. And you just go right to those limiting beliefs and that deep subconscious rooted behavior that probably keeps repeating itself. And some people can't figure out why. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of times we have to go back into time whenever maybe they were a child. I love the value of inner child work. I do it a lot because it feels like most of our wounds are there located from childhood. Whether, you know, that wound was created by ourselves and our belief system and what we thought was happening or whether we had real trauma, we're still left wounded and we're still sometimes as adults coming from that perspective of that child without even knowing it. Beautiful. So that's perfect. Where So where is the adult who's just, I don't know what to do. I've tried all sorts of stuff. They don't even know what about shamanism, shamanism. And so where do they start? Well, I always start with a client. I always want to know their coping skills first. And whenever we're going to do this delicate work, I want to make sure that they have a toolbox that they can come back from, right? Um, and one of those things in the toolbox is being able to sit with emotions, right? We're living in the society of avoidance and distraction. And sometimes if we feel something painful or even discomforting, Oh, no, no, no. I need to I need to get away from it. So I really want to make sure that they have the ability to A, be aware of what is happening. I had a session um, last week and I was asking the client, uh, we were talking about a belief system that he had that has been like self-sabotaging his romantic relationships. And I was asking him, no, but what do you do specifically? Like, what do you specifically do? Well, I don't really do anything. And I'm like, oh, wait, wait no, there. <laughs> it's all going on in the mind. I said, no, I want to know about your body language. I want to know what you're saying, what you're doing. How are you pulling back? So I want to take people into that space of awareness. And I also want to make sure that they can breathe. They can sit and meditate. They can sit with their feelings and their emotions. I like um, them to be comfortable with being vulnerable before we even start the inner child work first because that can that can really bring up some trauma and if they're not ready to look at that trauma it can do more harm if they're not prepared for it yeah for sure sometimes you have to slow down and step back and okay we can't do this right now it has to come later you're just too you're still in the oven <laughs> of the yes. drama exactly exactly it's like we have to go into that observer's mind where we can watch ourselves and see ourselves, And yeah. the value of that, I mean, I still see myself doing things from a long time ago and I'm like, oh, Laura's doing that old pattern again. There she is, you know, and 
being able to have that perspective in a playful way too is very helpful instead of taking it so serious. Yeah, I know exactly what you mean. There's now it's a thing where I see it and I'm like, ah, <laughs> I like you <laughs> notice. Yeah, I know exactly what's happening and why. And yeah, observe yourself. You remind me of Michael Singer when he's talking about that, like sitting back and observing. You know, Michael Singer, the untethered soul is the name. Yes. Of it. Yes. I love that book so much. It's a great book. Yeah, it's such a brilliant, like, oh. This is exactly what we're all doing all the time. So I love it too. And you said back there, sit with it, that we don't want to sit with it. And I'm kind of wondering, like, nowadays, there's so many distractions, right? We have just, even like, people can't watch a video. We have to have TikTok because we can't hold our attention for more than a minute or something. <laughs> and it's, I wonder, and then so mental health is also on the rise, right? And so it's, is it a part where people are looking and like, oh, this guy has the greatest life because we only see the pictures they put on Instagram. And back in the day that people did actually have to stay with their feelings because they're, it was harder to get distracted. Not that they couldn't be distracted, but there was a lot less distraction. So people would sit with it, move through it and then on. Yes, you're right. I mean, I was just telling another therapist that I do a lot of collaboration work with that. COVID really, in a way, was a pa positive catalyst to have people see that they have wounds and issues and things they need to work on because the avoidance mechanisms were limited, right? I mean, we still had our phones and a lot, I know a lot, the drinking really rose up and people were doing that a lot more as an escape. But for the most part, they if you were shut down and on lockdown, you really couldn't go out and do anything. So you were kind of just with you and yourself, especially if you lived alone. So um, I really do believe that we are hiding from our issues a lot of the time. You know, even a person that looks like a type A person that's super ambitious and is really productive and goes from thing to thing to thing, they can be avoiding and hiding from the issues that are inside as well. Yeah, for sure. It's and that's why they're so productive. It's because they just avoid it and they go and do <laughs> other stuff. I feel sometimes I'm like that. Yeah, um, me too. I get it. I love this conversation. So maybe now can we switch more to your business side of it and uh, meditation, speaking, all sorts of things that you got going on. Yeah, so I um, I have a private practice and see people individually, but I also build retreats and workshops. And I'll host about one or two workshops a month, and then I'll do a big end of the year international retreat. Uh, last year we were in Cuernavaca, Mexico. It was a lot of fun. So I do that, and then I also go and speak for different companies um, about mental health. One of the one of my favorite topics to talk about is how we can bridge neuroscience and spirituality in our practices that we do. And that always has a lot of positive feedback. And I always get so like passionate and jazzed when I'm talking about it. So I'm also doing that work as well. Yeah, that's amazing. I love it. That's all the same, similar to me. And I, I think I've noticed that too, that people are hungry for the science. It's almost like science is a religion now. And people are, as long as it's science says it, it's like, okay. <laughs> yeah. Even though it's constantly changing. Um, right. No, but I, I tell my clients, I think that's one of the reasons they have such a buy-in with me too, is I'm telling them the science of what's happening. So I took this woman um, a week ago, one of my clients, I took her on a journey, on a shamanic journey, and she came back the next session and she said, what the hell was that? <laughs> like, she was like, that was the most powerful thing I've ever done in my life, but I have no idea. She's like all day, the next day I was like, how did that happen? Where did I go? What happened? And so I was able to tell her about, because I did some drumming with her. So when we hear the drum, our brain is going into the theta brainwave. And the theta brainwave is where there's um, high creativity. You're going into your subconscious field a little bit more. You have that trance state. And so I was telling her the science of that and what was going on with her brain while she was there. And she was like, it was so crazy because I was losing track of time. I said, kind of like a dream, right? And she said, yes, it was like a dream. I said, well, theta is the dream state. It's when we're in REM. 
So she, I mean, she loved, she was like, that I have the science to describe what happened to me is so cool. So I love doing that with clients is telling them, breaking it down, like what's actually happening in their brain. We do these ceremonies and rituals. And then the beautiful knock-on effect of that is it produces a neuroplastic reaction, right? Yes. Yes. We're laying down new brain waves, depending on what we're working on, if we're healing or if we're going into a different space, a different reality that we've never seen before in our mind, you're still laying down that neural pathway because our brain doesn't know the difference between me imagining being somewhere. Like if I wanted to imagine the mountains of Colorado or actually being there, it doesn't know the difference between the two. Hashtag lemon. exactly i have a question because i have sometimes people come on here and talk about ayahuasca and i did like 42 ceremonies and i'm like maybe it's not your thing and so is there too much you can do and what, what does that look like obviously it's different for everybody but i always anytime people ask me about ayahuasca I always tell them that you really have to make sure that you're mentally prepared for this kind of medicine. And uh, for me, because, you know, I'm a a therapist, so I always want to be as ethical as possible. I tell them to make sure they've been doing some sort of healing work and they've been exposed to that, something that they've been doing internal, right? Uh, And then the other thing I tell them is ayahuasca finds you. You don't have to find ayahuasca. And if you're meant to take it, it will come to you. You will get offered or it will come across your your life somehow. And I really believe that because I think when the medicine wants you to take it, the medicine will find you. And it's just a magical substance that it just happens that way. You don't have to go online and book a ayahuasca retreat in Peru or something like that. I I really do believe when it's your time, it will call to you. And it has, you know, it's come across my plane and I've I've done the medicine and I, I've had four journeys and it's, they've all been very revealing, but they've been at very different times of my life. And anytime ayahuasca calls, I know it's time, but I'm not going to go force myself into doing 42 ayahuasca ceremonies because I really do think that that can do some harm to the psyche. Thank you. That's exactly what I wanted because you're a therapist. You have the education, the background, go Aggies. And the idea is like, yeah, the idea is that, yeah, you can't, if you're doing something and it's not even ayahuasca, anything, like if you keep doing it and nothing's, you think you're healing, but you keep going back. I don't know, whatever. I digress. (laughs) No, absolutely. And honestly, while, when you said that, what's coming to me right now is a lot of people are using that as avoidance. When I take somebody into ceremony or I take them into a journey and they want to keep doing it over and over and over again, I want to know, are you using this practice now as a drug? Because that's not the intention. The intention here is to hold it as a sacred time and space. And what happens is if we do ayahuasca over and over and over again, it's losing that sacred space because it's just you're abusing it in a way. So it can happen that way. Yeah, I agree with you completely. 100%. I love it. Um, And so the idea of, oh, so like if you're just going to start with ayahuasca, it's healing. Like probably you should start with other things. I like the idea you said that it will find you, right? The student was ready, the master will appear, and it doesn't have to be a person. Um, But definitely, like, you can do self-screening, right? If you're listening to this podcast, you probably have enough awareness to self-screen yourself and go, okay, did I try this? What else did I try before that? And I'm not saying not to try it, but, yeah, when it comes to lots of times, it's, it's too much. I think as we begin to wind down, if this episode resonates with you, please like, subscribe, share, give us a review, uh, but no hard sell. And reach out to Laura. She's got so much going on. If this conversation resonates with you, then definitely reach out to her and she can have that conversation. And I think maybe we can turn it towards um, what are some kind of mentors or guides that you found on your way? You know, it started when I was around 12, I started to read a Deepak Chopra uh, book 
And I honestly can't even ever remember which one it was. It was one of, the, I mean, it was a long time ago, but I remember that opening me up. And, um, and then uh, I heard Jack Cornfield. And Jack Cornfield is incredible. And that opened me up more. And then I found Tara Brock, and that opened me up even more. Uh, and then I found Ram Das, and Ram Das is one of my favorites. When I listen to anything that one of his talks, you know, he's passed since, but they've created a podcast around his talks um, called "Be Here Now." And anytime I listen to his talks, it's just this. Just I feel like I'm vibrating at a higher frequency level by just listening. And just the profound statements he says. But in my life, um, some really powerful mentors for me um, that I've come across have been Dr. Frank Lawless. He is a clinical psychologist. He was on the board for the Dr. Phil show for a, a while. And uh, he's just a powerful shaman healer as well. So he's he's my mentor. I actually have lunch with him once every two weeks and always learn something from him. Uh, also, my family have been just incredible sources. They're ambitious, they're supportive, they're loving, they're compassionate. I really felt like I won the lottery in the family department. So they're definitely my mentors as well. I'm the youngest of the family, so I get a lot of support. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah, I saw some pictures on maybe Facebook, and you can tell your family is just tight, and that's amazing. Yeah. Love yes. it. So Ram Das, you're the third person in a couple of weeks that's been talking about Ram Das to me. And the way I take those kind of signals is like, that's God or the universe saying like, dude, you need to go and check it out more. Cause I don't know much about him except he looks like this crazy dude with a beard. And I think there's a Netflix documentary about it, but, uh -huh. um, so I'm going to have to definitely check it out. But I think I ask everyone this question. So this is the phase four podcast and phase four of the sixth phase meditation by Vishen Lakhiani is all about creating your future three years from today. So where is Laura three years from today? Oh, I love this question. Okay. Laura, future Laura is she is speaking and she's being a bigger catalyst and inspirational catalyst than she is now and helping people more than she is now still has clients that she sees individually and still building retreats and workshops and oh i've never seen this before um i'm seeing myself writing a book a new book so i, I don't even know what, what it will be about but i just saw that vision come to me so thank you for that question yeah that's awesome what a great answer and that's it, right? We're trying to grow, expand. Like you obviously know what you want and what, who you are for a long time. And so this is just next iteration, sounds like. Um, and then is there a big spiritual community around where you are in Texas? You're in Dallas, Fort Worth area? Yeah, you know that I'm in Fort Worth and this spiritual community is growing and it's so beautiful to see I have a meditation group that I hold here every Friday, and uh, it's called DFW Spirituality Meditation Group. And it's open to the public for the community. It's free for the community. And people come, and man, sometimes we have like 40 people show up, and it's packed, and people are meditating, whether they've never done it before or they're experienced meditators. We come and we do a little bit of socializing and then we do the meditation and we usually go to dinner or something after or a group of us. So it's a really cool spiritual community. We're all speaking the same language and we're all on this this path for transformation. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Wow, that's spectacular. Yeah, like I'm looking at the pictures. I don't know if this is your house, but just on the wall, the tree above underneath reminds me of like almost like Underneath is us inside, and then the tree on top is like outside where we reflect. And I see lots of people in this room, and I don't know if that's your house or not, but that looks like a place I want to be. Yeah, yeah, it's the meditation studio that we use, and we're just so fortunate to use that that studio. Uh, it's called Lama Stay Studio if you're ever in Fort Worth, but yeah, it's awesome. Very cool. And then at the end, I kind of like to let that guest. Bring it wherever you want. If you want to sell something, talk about your business, 
maybe something we didn't cover, anything that wherever you want to go. Um, you know, I, I actually, I want to say something that has been on my heart, uh, this month and it is to find your medicine and be bold with your medicine because we're, we're in this business, we're replicating the same thing over and over again. So if you're a therapist and you're just kind of replicating what's already been done or in any field, marketing, whatever it might be. Find your medicine and specialize it to make it be yours and what is intuitively in alignment for you. Because I think that once we start sharing the personalized medicine that we carry inside of us with the world, we will begin to heal on such a deeper level. So I just want to tell people, encourage people to go out and do your dream, do the thing that you think that you were put on this earth to do, break the mold. I love it. And I think 2024 is the year of authenticity. And yes. one of my company tagline is your story is your superpower. And that's exactly why. So we need everyone to have their own unique, authentic story and for push it out to the world. So thank you for reminding us all of that. My final question is, where can people reach you? So you can find me on Instagram and my Instagram handle is DFW, like Dallas, Fort Worth, and then spirituality altogether. You can also find me on my website and my website is uh, theshamanictherapist.com. And you can also find me on my podcast that just started. So yeah, it's it's in the making. Um, I have two episodes up. I'm actually going to record one today, so hopefully it will be three by the time you hear this. And that is the Shamanic Therapist podcast on Apple. Amazing. Laura, thank you so much for today. I'm so grateful for your time, your knowledge, your wisdom, and your heart. Thank you. Thank you. It has been great connecting with you. And I really appreciate the breath work you led at the beginning of this. That was really a heart opener for me. And thanks for having me on and looking forward to maybe working with you or collabing with you in the future.